By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. You guys can have a seat. Mark asked me this week, he said, man, how are you going to preach a whole sermon on one verse? I said, you, you do go to church here, right? Uh, and I'm thankful for, for Mark. If you uh, have been here for any length of time, you know that Mark is in the hugging ministry. Uh, he is a part of our hospitality team, and, um, and so he's probably shook your hand or given you a hug, and I'm thankful f- for him in that. Uh, Christianity is an embodied faith, and uh, man, I'm thankful to have him as part of our church. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open those up to Hebrews uh, chapter 11. Uh, by the way, my name is R.C. Ford. I'm the campus pastor here, and so visitors and guests, I'm, gl- I'm thankful that you're here today. Um, hope I get to meet you uh, today after service. But a- as you're opening up there to Hebrews 11, about 50 years after this epistle was written, um, in the year 155 A.D., and long before there was a Smyrna, Tennessee, uh, there was a city in, in uh, ancient Turkey. It was called Smyrna as well. And in the ancient city of Smyrna, uh, there was intense Christian persecution. The people of Smyrna hated the people of God because they claimed the exclusivity of Jesus and that he was the only way to God. And so uh, the city, uh, the townspeople in, in Smyrna, what they would often do with great enthusiasm is they would go to the arena in the city uh, to watch Christians be either mauled by wild animals or worse, burned alive. Eventually, the people of Smyrna demanded that the pastor of the church in Smyrna would be brought before the proconsul. This was a, an 86-year-old disciple of John. His name was Polycarp, 86 years old. And when they went to go arrest uh, Polycarp, he didn't fight He didn't run. He was like a lamb led to a slaughter. And they brought him before the proconsul in the arena. And they posed two uh, options for for him. At that day, they said that, Polycarp, you can either um, renounce Christ and cry out, Caesar is Lord, or uh, we're going to uh, give you a gruesome, gruesome death. And so the first urge from the proconsul was, Polycarp, renounce your faith. Swear that Caesar is Lord. And Polycarp denied. He refused to. He raised his hands against the crowd, lifted up to God, and he said this, 86 years I've been his servant, and he's done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? They said, well, we're going to throw you into wild animals if you do not repent. And he said, call him. It's unthinkable that I would turn from what is good and turn to evil. Do what you must do. Then they said, we're going to burn you with fire. And he said to them, you threaten me with a fire that will be extinguished in a few moments, but you know nothing of the eternal fire that is coming for the ungodly. Light it up. And that's exactly what they did. The pyre was built. Polycarp was put into the fire. He refused nails or straps to hold him down. He didn't fight at all. He lifted up a prayer of thanksgiving. He sang a hymn and they lit the fire. Polycarp was executed for following Jesus on February the 23rd of the year 155. What is it that made an old man, 86-year-old man, fearless when the whole world seemingly was against him? What made an old man so bold in the face of death? It was faith. It was faith. Polycarp had an assurance or a confidence of things unseen. He had a conviction of things 
hoped for in the future. He had a belief in God and that God rewards those who seek him. But he didn't just have an intellectual assent of these things. Polycarp had a faith that changed him. It changed his wants. It changed his will. It changed his desires. It changed his life and it changed his death. Polycarp had what the writer of Hebrews 11 called faith. Called faith. Last week, we kind of threw out the first pitch in this series called By Faith in the Book of Hebrews. Hebrews 11 is what we're walking through. Um, 26 times the word faith is used in chapter 11, but 19 times the phrase by faith is used. 19 times in one chapter. Now, you and I should say, okay, why this enormous repetition here? Why is this repetition of by faith over and over again? Why is it necessary? Well, in order for us to understand that, we have to know what was going on in the church that he's writing to. You see, salvation or justification, um, being right with God, has always been by faith. In the Old Testament, it was by faith looking forward to Jesus. And in the New Testament, it's all about looking back in faith at what Jesus did on the cross. It's always been justification by faith. But there was a problem. The, the, the church here he's writing to was full of a lot of Jewish Christians. And they had slowly gotten away from justification by faith. And they had begun to twist Christianity and deteriorate it into a religion of works. Works, justification of works. They tried to earn God's favor by doing things, uh, by thinking that God was kind of keeping score by their religious activity, like outweighing the goodies and the baddies, and then God would just be pleased with us. They got it down and twisted it up into an, a justification by works. And then Jesus says in Matthew 23, he says, what they began to do was to strain at gnats and swallow camels. In other words, they began to fight and nitpick at the little small, little minute things of the law while swallowing camels, big, huge, moral, moral issues. They had deteriorated at justification by faith alone and twisted it up to a justification by works. And you know what? God hated it. He hated it. Why did God hate it so bad? Because it replaces God with men. That's why. I think one of the reasons that it happened was because men human, we get no glorification in justification by faith, right? We, there's no glory in it for us if it's all by faith. We're all about work. So we're always fighting that. And this is no different than the church today, is it not? It's just like this. Theologically, we know we're justified by faith, but it's so easy for all of us, including me, to fall into this twisting of Christianity into works, giving, serving, Attending busyness, thinking that that's pleasing to God. And then, of course, we start straining at gnats, small things, what to wear, what kind of music to listen to, what uh, view of the millennial should we fall into, what is the view of eschatology. We start to strain at all those gnats, and we swallow camels. We swallow big, major moral issues in our life. We're no different. And we, like the readers of this letter, we need to hear this over and over again. And that is where the, the writer of Hebrews says, no, 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 no. It's, it's not justification by works. It's justification by faith. It has always been by faith. And so let me show you, Hebrews, let me show you, Stewart's Creek. Let me rewind. Let me go back to the Old Testament and let me show you it's always been by faith. And let me, in fact, let me, let me just show you it's been by faith. Let me show you what faith looks like. And that is what he begins to do. And CJ kicked this thing off last week. And what we saw was by faith, 
Abel's faith looked like giving his best to God. Enoch, his faith looked like walking with God. And today in the story of Noah, Noah's faith meant trusting in God to be saved. The story of Noah is what we're going to look at today. Now, what's important to note here is that Noah was the great-grandson of Enoch, which last week we were told that Enoch was a a righteous man by his faith, right? And so what happened was is Enoch, uh, he passed his faith down to uh, Methuselah. Methuselah passed it down to Lamech, and Lamech passed it down to Noah. Dads, there is an incredible lesson for us right here. If you're a dad, listen. Real faith does not die out with you. It is passed down to your children. Your children, my children, there's no greater inheritance that you can give to your children than an inheritance of faith. Why? Because if your children have God, they have everything. They have everything. What are you passing down to your children? Now, the story of Noah, listen, you're familiar with this story. The, the, the listeners to this letter were familiar with this story. Now, usually when this story is, of course, brought up, it's usually depicted as a cute kid's story, arc animals, right? That's typically the picture that we get Uh, maybe in your kid's nursery or your kid's room at home. Although, of course, you know the real story. It's really not preschoolish or or PG at all, is it? I mean, God killed everyone in the story except for eight people. This is a very sobering story. Now, usually you don't see that, that in the murals at church or at home, do you? Like, nobody's drawing, like, people floating down the water, dead, right? We're probably not down there at kids' ministry today telling the kids, hey, draw pictures of dead bodies and take those home to mom and dad today. That's probably not happened. But but what I'm not saying we go there. But what I am saying is we do need to stop juvenilizing this story. We do need to do that. When you talk to your children about this story, I'm not saying scare them like sinners in the hands of an angry God or anything, but... You do need to teach them the story here. This is a real story. It's a real story about a real God who really judges wicked, evil people. But it's also about a real God who saves people who have real faith in the real Jesus. So this is a great, great story. So today in this story... Looking at Noah, we're going to see, I think, three things, not necessarily that Noah does, but I want you to think about what faith does. Three things. I think we're going to see that faith knows that judgment is imminent. Faith knows that salvation is exclusive. And faith knows that God's promises are true. So look at those three things here. The first thing is that judgment is imminent. Faith knows that. Faith knows that judgment is imminent. Let's, uh, if you'll flip back in your Bible. Again, this is a familiar story. Go back to Genesis 6. We do not have time to go through all of Genesis 6 in the story. So I've pulled down a few verses here that should give us a scene. Genesis 6, 11 through 13. Love to hear pages turning. All right, here we go. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, in just a few chapters ago, if you'll remember, God said that everything was good. The earth was good. Mankind was created to fill the earth with praise. 
Because of the curse of sin, though, sin had spread so far and so wide. And the sin that entered in the world didn't just bring pain and suffering and toiling. Sin, or I'm sorry, sin brought this unspeakable evil, unimaginable corruption and perversion all over the earth. Instead of humanity being full of praise, they were full of evil, corruption, power, violence, sexual immorality, murder. Every intention of the heart was corrupt, we are told. Matthew 24, as Jesus recalls this, said that while all those things were happening, the people were just eating and drinking and marrying, careless living, living their best life now, unaware of any spiritual matters. When they should have been praying and repenting and asking God for forgiveness. That's what they should have been doing, but that's not what they were doing at all. And God sees all of it because God is everywhere and he's all-knowing. And he tells Noah, it's time for the wicked to pay. Jump down to verse 17. God said this, For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. So bad that God has decided to wipe out all of humanity outside of Noah and his family there's, there's varying reports or numbers about how many people this is. No one truly knows. But it's been estimated at anywhere between 2 and 10 billion people. 2 and 10 billion people. That's pretty serious evil. Imagine t- today, for example, we have 7.8 billion people on the planet. You just imagine the magnitude of this judgment. God tells Noah that, and we know that from Noah's response, he believed God. He didn't just believe in God, he believed God. That's what faith does, by the way. It doesn't just believe in God, it believes God. It believes what he says. And we know that he definitely believed that. He had, this, he had faith in an unseen promise that judgment was imminent because that's what faith does faith does believe that judgment is imminent it's so easy for us to spend an hour on twitter or facebook or watching lester holt uh, with the evening news and begin to wonder when is flood 2.0 going to come Our earth is filled with unimaginable evil. It's not hard to find it. Violence, murder, and corruption is everywhere. Think about violence. I don't know if you've seen these shows on A&E. They've got these shows called Neighbor Wars, uh, Road Wars. It's just literally series after series of people just beating the fool out of each other. Violence, uncontrollably. We see extreme sinful gun violence that's happening in our world. You look at me wrong, you bully me, or I even suspect that you're doing anything, I'll shoot you in the face. We see lawlessness, lying, and looting. Surely you've seen videos of people, idiots, just going into stores and just taking whatever they want to. Evil, violence, and corruption, no justice. I think worse in our society that violence, murder, and corruption is even legalized. And it happens by the pens of the politicians. We certify doctors to go into plan parenthoods all around the country to murder. 
We see people advocating for the genital mutilization or mutilation of children in the name of trans health care. Legal. We don't trust a child to choose their meals or bedtime, but we let them choose their gender. This is wicked. Gross sexual immorality. You realize today there are over 25 million sex slaves. Oh, slavery is a big deal in the sex industry. Trafficking. Prostitution is as rampant as ever. It's just done online now. Let's think about the more micro-sexual immorality that continues to happen when people have sex before or after marriage or outside of marriage with a man or a woman. We see powerful people in high places in Hollywood and all big cities, powerful people using evil propaganda, committing horrible acts of violence on our minds and on the minds of our children. Predatory drag performers dancing sexually in front of children. Target's tucking line of clothing. Far-right extremists responding with great acts of violence. We see churches caving to culture. We see churches where they're covering up sexual abuse and abusing authority. All the while, you know that the devil is rejoicing in all of the wickedness on this earth. All the while, people are just eating, drinking, marrying, going to work, raising kids, vacationing when they should be praying, repenting, and asking God for forgiveness. Paul tells the Colossians on these things, account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Our faith believes that judgment is imminent. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that no one knows when, not angels, not even the Son knows, only the Father. But as in the days of Noah will be the coming of the Son of Man. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you have faith in the unseen promise that Jesus is going to? to return to the earth. And I mean a conviction, a confidence, an assurance of these things that he's coming to judge the wicked earth, but he's going to come and complete our redemption. Do you have faith in that? Let me ask question two. Has your faith in that changed the way that you live? That's an entirely different thing. Has it changed the way that you live? Because it clearly changed the way Noah lived, right? Has it changed the way you live? If it hasn't changed the way you live, you probably don't have biblical faith. But Noah didn't just know that judgment was coming, that judgment was imminent. He also knew that salvation was exclusive. It's the second thing I want us to see here. Salvation was, it is exclusive. Look at Genesis 6, 8. It says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. You would probably want to ask the question, why did Noah find favor? It wasn't because Noah was perfect, and it wasn't because Noah was better than the other billions of people. Noah found favor because of his faith. That was the only reason he found favor in God, because that's what God has favor on. God has favor on people who have faith. God tells Noah that everything's going to die, everything's going to be judged. But Noah, 
There's a way to escape this death. If you'll build an ark, you take you and your family and two of every kind of animal, you'll have safe passage through the waters. All Noah had to do was go build an ark. Now, this is an incredible opportunity for a little bit of sensible doubt to come in. Wouldn't you agree? If you put yourself in the situation and God gave you those instructions, I mean, wouldn't you say, oh, ho, 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 hold on now. Wait, uh, flood, like, what's that? <laughs> the earth had never seen a flood before. What is that? Boat, ark, never constructed a thing like that. You want to run those specks by me again, God? I didn't catch all those. It sounds pretty important, right? But that's not what, that's not what Noah did. He didn't have all of the answers, but yet he obeyed all that God had commanded him. That's what we see. He obeyed. It says that he built the ark. If you look at Hebrews eleven seven 7 again, it says that he built the ark by faith. He built it by faith. That's incredibly important because Noah was no carpenter. He was no master craftsman. He didn't build the ark by skill or his experience. He didn't build it because he had good instructions. Because we all know clear instructions don't always equal perfect assembly, right? Ikea, when's the last time you put something together? Just because you've got clear instructions don't mean it's easy. So he, he wasn't saved because he built an ark. He wasn't saved by building an ark. He was saved by having faith in God. Not by a great boat, but by a great God. And Noah believed it. And then he acted on God's word. And then look at verse, six, uh, verse 18, what God says to him. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. So, of course, that once the 40 days and 40 nights of rain begin and the floodwaters begin to burst onto the earth, Genesis 7, 16 says that no one's family came in, that God shut up the ark. And when he did that, I want you to think about this for just a moment. When God shut them up in the ark, they were not just safe, they were invincible. They weren't safe because, again, because of the construction of the ark or because Noah used a lot of pitch to seal it up. That's not why he was safe. He was safe. He was invincible Because he was in the hand of God, the promise of God. That's why he was invincible. That's how safe Noah was and his family. God saved Noah again, not because he was perfect. And it wasn't because he built a perfect boat. It was because he had faith in a perfect God and his perfect word Salvation is really, it's no different now than it was then. And this is where we have to make the translation here. Salvation comes by faith and faith alone in Jesus alone, who is the greater ark. Acts 4.12. There is salvation in no one else For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Whether it's Abraham, Moses, Noah, or you, every single human that's ever lived on the earth has only and always will ever be saved by faith. And this, of course, is our biggest problem. You and I both need to remember that the wicked world is not our biggest problem. 
You know, so easy right now to look at the world, and I've just described the corruption and violence. It's so easy to look at all of the wickedness and the evil and the corruption and the violence that's out there. We got 2020 vision when it comes to that. But the greatest problem, the greatest evil, the greatest wickedness is the wickedness in me and the wickedness in you. That is your greatest threat in your life, my life, that we have sinned against a holy God. And there's nothing that we can do by our own effort and work to appease the wrath of God. We deserve the same fate as those who are pounding on the outside of the ark, begging to let God Uh, let us in that's our fate that's our plight that's what we deserve but when you and i trust in the ark that is christ and you come into the ark by faith and faith alone not only are you saved you are safe forever and ever invincible When you're in Christ, you are so invincible that in order for you to lose your salvation, get kicked out of heaven, or have God turn his back on you, God would have to do all of that to Jesus, and he will never do that. That's how safe you are in Christ, that is the ark who saves us. Salvation, it is exclusive though let's make sure in the picture of the ark salvation was only for those who were in the ark no one else was saved salvation is the same for us today it is exclusive it's not universal everybody doesn't get saved it's only for those who have faith in jesus story doesn't end with knowing that judgment is imminent or that salvation is exclusive the story ends with Faith knowing that God's promises are true. Let's look at that third point and final point. You know, Genesis 8 8 records, again, we don't have time to go through all of this, but it records the first thing that Noah does when he reaches dry land. He he gives an atonement for sin. He he burns, uh, he offers burnt sacrifices. Why did Noah do that? Again, it's it's a temporary atonement for sin. Even though that God had washed away sinners from the earth, it still didn't wash away sin. It's important for you to understand that. Uh, Sin was still present on the earth. We know that that's going to be the case because Noah, pretty soon in a few more chapters, is going to get drunk and naked. And uh, good thing they didn't have TikTok videos back then for Noah, but... We know that sin and even the line of sin continued through the generations of Noah. But but this, this sacrifice that Noah was doing was a pleasing aroma to God. He delighted in the sacrifices. It was, a, it was a sacrifice pointing to the ultimate sacrifice that is in Christ. So in that being pleased with the sacrifice, God makes a promise to Noah. Through this promise that he made. To Noah, he said, I will never flood the earth again. Specifically, God said that he would never bring a cataclysmic flood to the earth that would destroy pretty much all of eternity. Not everybody, but pretty much all of eternity. No cataclysmic floods that will ever happen to this degree ever again. Tell that to the uh, climate change people. Uh, They need to know that. And in order to signify this promise that God made, he gave a sign. And you know this sign, Genesis 9, 12 through 13. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. That's us. I have set my bow in the cloud And it shall be a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. Let you think about a rainbow for just a minute. 
get it, get it in your, your mind's eye for just a moment. It's not really a, it's not just a rainbow. This is God's bow is what the scripture just said, didn't it? So this is God's bow. It didn't say God's rainbow. It said God's bow. And this sign, this sign was a reminder to all generations that God would never, ever again flood the earth in this cataclysmic way. They would never bring this kind of judgment to the earth until the Redeemer would come in the future. This bow or rainbow in English translation, this is not a symbol for pride. This is a symbol for a promise. Teach your children what a rainbow is. Now you get that, your mind's eye again. Picture the rainbow, the bow right now in your mind's eye. Notice where it's pointing. It's not pointing down. This is God's bow. It's not pointing down towards us, is it? It's pointing up at the heavens. It's not pointing down here to shoot at us and strike us down, although that's what we deserve. It's pointed up at the heavens. When you look at the rainbow, when I look at the rainbow... We need to think about the cross because this is exactly what happened on the cross. It should have been us. God's war bow should have been aimed directly at us, deserving of his wrath. But instead, his bow was aimed at the very heart of heaven, his one and only son, Jesus. He received the wrath that should have been on us. This is being saved by faith. Right on the cross, think about it like this, right on the cross, what Jesus was doing, he was not bringing destruction Of wicked people, he was bringing salvation to wicked people like you and like me. The Bible does say that there is a future holocaust of judgment that is coming. That is what awaits us. God will never destroy the earth again with waters, but we are told that he will destroy it by a fire. And we believe that. We've not seen it, but we believe it. We also believe that there's only one way to be saved, by trusting in the better Noah, by having faith in the ark of of Christ and trusting in the promises of God. How do we respond to this today? I thought about this this morning. Um, we, we, have to, we have to consider a couple of things, and this will just be a, a short, brief piece here of, of how do we, what does this mean for my life kind of thing. The, answering the question, of course, so what, however you want to say it. When, when Christians read this story and we say that we have faith that judgment is imminent and that salvation is exclusive only in faith in Jesus and that God's promise is true and that we are safe and secure and invincible forever and ever, that kind of faith has to change the way that we live or it is not true faith. It doesn't just change our minds. It doesn't just change our beliefs. It changes our lives. Like Noah, it changes our desires, our wills, our wants, our goals, 
Everything about us is changed when we have this kind of faith. Faith kind of moves through three domains of our life. I think first thing that faith does is it informs the mind, then it inflames the heart, but then it activates the hands and the feet. If it doesn't do that, it's not real faith. And so what do you do with it? How do we activate these things? Here's what I think. Three things, we could talk a lot about things that that I saw that Noah's faith do here, uh, but I want to bring up three with you because I think we can learn from this. Number one, faith stands strong against a wicked world. This man and his family stood strong against a wicked, wicked world, and he did not compromise He was willing to stand strong even if it meant standing alone because standing alone with God was far safer than standing with the world. But he stood strong against a wicked world. That's what faith does. And we are in a wicked world and we are called to stand strong in a wicked world. He only had seven other people with him. You've got a lot more than that. Praise be to God. The kingdom of God is way, way bigger than it was back then. You have a church here to stand with you. Stand strong in a wicked world. Do not compromise. The second thing I see with faith calls us to do is to obey God's word, right? God told Noah to do something, and we are told God did all that or Noah did all that God commanded. It didn't say Noah considered some things. He, he got seven out of ten things right, or he went home to pray about what to do. Uh, it said that, it didn't say he did his best. It said he did all of what the Lord commanded him to do because that's what faith does. Faith obeys. Faith obeys. Where in your life right now, what's that thing, what's that area of your life right now that you just, you know you're not obeying God. Faith obeys God. Faith does something else. Faith preaches, and faith is a witness. Second Peter tells us that Noah was a herald of righteousness for 120 years while he built the boat. That's so important, y'all. Noah didn't just say, well, you know what? I'm going to move far away from the wicked world. I'm going I'm to build this commune out in the middle of nowhere with my family, and, and we're safe. Me and my family are good. To hell with everybody else. That's not what he did. He, for 120 years, estimation, he stood there and he preached for 120 years. What a pastorate, Noah. 120 years. Hey, judgment's God's coming. But you know what? You don't have to suffer. You can be saved. Just come into the ark. Just believe. 120 years of sermons like that over and over and over again. Not a one believed. (laughs) I mean, I just think about that man's willingness and perseverance to pastor. Like, I get upset when some people don't listen on a Sunday. This guy did it for 120 years. That's what faith does. Faith preaches. Faith is a witness. And so let me make that a little bit more personal for just a moment because chances are You have someone that you love dearly, either a friend, a family member, a child, a mother, a father, neighbor, and right now you know them and they are out in the rain. They are outside of the ark. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. They're eating, they're drinking, they're marrying, working raising kids, they're not thinking about God at all. And you know exactly who I'm talking about right now. It 
It is our responsibility to stand strong in the wicked world, to reject cowardice, to reject emotions or someone canceling or unfriending us, to go to them in love, in truth, and say, hey, God's judgment is coming. Salvation is possible for you in the ark that is Christ. God's promises are true, and we have to do it for the rest of our life, even if nobody ever listens, because that's what Noah did. Who is waiting on you? Is your faith going, and is your faith witnessing to a wicked world? Christians, that's what we do. We respond in those kind of ways, and a lot of other ways, but that's what we have today. Let me talk to the person who's here today, and you might be the begrudging person. You're here. Someone dragged you. You really don't want to be here. Um, they're inviting you. You're appeasing a wife or a neighbor because they invited you. You're tired. You're just like, man, I'm just trying to keep the peace, man. I'll, I'll go to church, and maybe you're a skeptic here today. You don't know what's going on in the world. You don't really know what to believe, and you're more on the agnostic side, and uh, maybe you're here today, and you're not assured of where you are. Like, you, you think you have faith, but you're not really sure, and so you, you're kind of like, I don't really know if I have it or not. Let me, let me talk to you for just a moment. Let me say this. Believing in God is insufficient to save you. It takes no special ability whatsoever in this world, no spiritual pulse to believe in God. Creation reveals that to everybody. Just look outside. He's everywhere. It takes no ability, no spiritual gifting whatsoever to believe God in that he exists. It's necessary But it can't stop right there. Real faith believes not only in God, but it believes God. Believes everything about him. His promises. Judgment is imminent. Salvation is exclusive. God's promises are true. So I say this to you today. The door to the ark is still open. The door is still open. You can turn to God and receive his gift of Jesus Christ, our greater ark, or you can keep standing outside in the rain. But be sure of this, one day that door of grace will shut and all of those who've rejected Jesus Christ will be swept away in the flood. Stop believing in yourself for salvation. Renounce self or any other way to be right with God. Trust in Christ by faith and faith alone. That's our response today. And so Benji and the band are going to come up. And so I want to give space for people to do some things here. Deacons, would you, um, if you've been aside this week to be uh, available for prayer, would you go ahead and come on up as well? Um, If there's anything that is going on in your life, anything where the the word of every every week, the the word of God is spoken, it should prompt things up in us. It might be moving you to obey in an area of your life. It might be to uh, say, hey, I'm doubting. I've, I've lost some faith. I need some help here. Can you pray for me, for God to give me greater faith? Um, Whatever it may be, these deacons are available for you to come and just Feel the warm embrace of a brother or sister in Christ and letting them know that they love you and they want to pray for you. That's one reason you can get up and move today. The other reason is if you are here today and you truly, you want to trust in Christ today for the first time by faith, man, you can come up and just pray with them as well. They would love to walk through that with you. We're going to give a few minutes to do that. We'll sing out of here on the way out. Um, I want to give you space to do that. Again, if you are a visitor or guest or have questions about anything today that I've said, um, stop by, see us on the way out. I'd love to, to talk with you and maybe even pray with you. All right?